Well, good morning, everyone, especially people at St. Francis. I see people from different parishes also. Good to have you from different parts of the of the country during our COVID experience. Okay, uh, we talked about uh, the Luke and parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee yesterday with great aplomb and um, and the issue uh, of the of the Son of Man. Today we're on the a very interesting character only found in Luke. It's Zacchaeus, the tax collector. So it tends to bounce off to what we talked about yesterday about the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. Well, here's Zacchaeus and he is a chief tax collector. And it's going to be interesting uh, uh, why this is only found in Luke. Now, don't forget, Luke is the gospel writer that favors the outsider. Favors the downcast, okay? Uh, doesn't necessarily favor Israel nor Jews, but will favor um, those who are struggling with themselves or with others, or, or most especially with God, or people that are misunderstood by the reigning powers that be. And uh, so the outcast, or in this particular case, the chaos gets the short end of the stick until uh, he sticks up for his rights and Jesus comes and visits him at his home. So let's get to the narrative itself. This is Luke chapter 19, verses one through 10. It's one of my favorite Jesus parables. He entered Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there, was named Zacchaeus. Uh, interesting name, it doesn't abound much in the Old Testament. He was a chief tax collector and was very rich. Okay, not just a tax collector, a chief tax collector and very rich. Again, tax collectors were collaborating with the Roman Imperium. So they knew what they were about. They knew exactly that they would not be friends with their neighbors because tax collectors had to collect tax for the Roman Imperium. <clears throat> Three types of taxes, Roman Imperium to the emperor, to Herod, king of Israel, and then thirdly, the temple. So people were being taxed out of their minds for the sake of those who had money, wealth, prestige, and power. And the chaos was one of them a chief tax collector, one of many, and then he was very rich. So, so Zacchaeus, you're getting rich over our skin. You're getting rich over us. And, you know, why do you have to collaborate with the Roman Imperium in the first place? Can't you do something else? Obviously not. So as the uh, parabolic device continues, Jesus was passing through Jericho and he was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. Now in the Greek, we don't know who's small. Is Jesus small or is Zacchaeus small? It's unclear. One thing that does happen is that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus period, and he'll do anything to get what he wants in this regard. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. Now the sycamore tree, like the fig tree, like the olive tree represents Israel, okay? Very important. So he ran up ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. So it's premeditated. I want to see Jesus. I've heard about this man, this wonder worker, this healer of great renown, and I want to see him. And, uh, and of course, Jericho is the oldest city on the planet. It dates to about 9,500 years, okay? So Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, come down now, for I must stay at your house today. 
Now, you have to ask, and this is Luke for the outsider, okay? Jesus, couldn't you stay at someone else's house? Couldn't you stay at a house of a well-known Pharisee? But no, you had to stay at Zacchaeus' house. Now, there's a reason to that, okay? Now, he's eaten, uh, Jesus ate meals with sinners before and with Pharisees before. Matthew was a tax collector, remember? Matthew or Levi, that's his other name. He ate with tax collectors. The day that uh, Jesus called uh, Levi or Matthew, I'm sure the other apostles thinking, what are you doing, Jesus? What you're thinking on this, Jesus? Why are you calling someone, you know, darn well, that's not going to be appropriate uh, to the crowds that you're preaching to? And I might add, to the rest of us apostles, why'd you have to choose him? Could you choose someone else? A little bit more safer, you know, kind of a safe person, but no. So, and I could just hear uh, some of the apostles that evening. Yes, we were going to dinner tonight, Matthew's house. And you know who's going to be there? Other tax collectors, the people outside the law, and doggone it. We are going to be hounded by the Pharisees. And sure enough, peering, peering through the windows, you have the Pharisees looking. Why does your master eat with sinners? Of course, Jesus overhears it and says, because uh, I've come to call sinners to repentance. I'm making a house call. These are sick people. I'm a doctor. These are people outside the law. I'm just not eating dinner with them. I'm giving them a lesson about repentance. Again, there's no indication at what he was doing while he was having dinner. What do you think he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about the kingdom of God and about repentance. These people need to repent and change their doggone lives. And in Matthew, especially, the scribes the Pharisees complain, and Jesus makes it very clear, go, do, you go back and learn something. It's not sacrifice that God wants, but he wants mercy. Go learn that. So it's a direct confrontation with, with the Torah teachers of, of uh, Israel. He knows exactly what he's doing. You know, so, but, you know, Jesus, you know, why can't you play it safe? Why do you have to do that? Because, because he's, he's visiting sinners. He's reaching out to those who are outside. He is for the outsider. As well as for the insider. So, and there's Jesus walking in Jericho. Zacchaeus up in the tree. Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house this evening, as I stayed in Matthew's and other people's homes. Well, okay. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome. I could just see him scurry down and is delighted that this rabbi, who is a preacher of the Torah and a wonder worker and a miracle worker, works signs and wonders and healings. He's going to eat at my house tonight. Okay. And all who saw it began to grumble. No kidding. What do you think they're going to do? And he said he is going to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Amen. Bad company breeds bad morals. You know? Why are you doing this? Why do you keep company with people outside the law and those who are collaborating with our enemies? Didn't you learn anything? Every time we go against the Torah, every time we get combined with Gentilism, we tend to forget God and we go into exile. Do you want to go that again?
Jesus, why can't you just deal with normal, obedient, adherent Jews? But no, you're going after sinners. And people are complaining. He's gone to the house of a sinner. Jesus, what in heaven's name are you doing? Well, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's making a house call. Okay. And what the people know about Zacchaeus is not true to what and who Zacchaeus really is. And this is the point. Men see faces, God sees hearts. We go right back to the tax collector and the Pharisees back in the temple. The Pharisee makes a judgment about the tax collector from his external form, from what he appears to be like. He doesn't know the internal form, which is the moral conscience. He didn't know that the tax collector was repenting while he was in the temple. Okay. So he makes a mistake. So the Pharisee is thanking God that he's not like other sinners or other people that are disobedient. Because if you're disobedient, <clears throat> we can go back into exile again. You want that to happen? So keep your mouth shut and obey the Torah. That guy over there, that tax collector, standing afar, you know, aloof and far off. What is he doing? He's, I can tell that he's mumbling and he's beating his breast and his head is downcast. These are all signs of repentance. Didn't you get it, Pharisee? Obviously not. You made a moral judgment on a man's conscience which you knew nothing about. You're making a judgment on appearance. Men see faces, God sees hearts. You made a mistake. Yes, your prayer was good. God, I'm thankful that I'm not like other people. That's fine. And, uh, and I'm thankful that, I'm, that I tithe 10% of all my earnings and I fast twice a week, all of which are good prayers. But then he makes a mistake. I'm going to make a judgment on that person over there by external form, by his external appearance. Why is he even here in the temple in the first place? <clears throat> He's a Roman collaborator and a Jew at that. He shouldn't be here. On the contrary, he should be there. Why? He was repenting. Okay. And so, going back to Zacchaeus now, he's gone to the house of a sinner. What is Jesus thinking of? He knows exactly what he's thinking of. He knows the game plan. And he knows that people are, are in fact going to grumble. Let them grumble. <clears throat> Let them grumble. Okay, go back to the text. He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood his ground and said to the Lord, Lord, look, half of my processions, Lord, <clears throat> I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Okay. The grumblers didn't know that. So Zacchaeus stood his ground and says, wait a minute. I know what they're saying about me. I know that I'm a rich chief tax collector. But I'm going to tell you something, Jesus of Nazareth. Half of what I take, half of my possessions, I give to the poor. So there. They don't know that, but I want you to know that. And if I've cheated or defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay it back four times. The Torah says if you cheat someone, repent, you have to pay it back double. Under Roman law, you pay it back four times. It double Torah. <clears throat> he's doing better than what Torah. He's doing better than what Torah says. He's doing better. He doesn't just follow the Torah. He's following 
Roman law. So what does Jesus have to say? He, he says plenty. Interesting statement. What does Jesus say to him? Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. That's a play on words, by the way. Today salvation has come to your house. It's a play on words. Jesus means Yahweh saves or God saves. He's salvation incarnate. He's the mercy of God incarnate. He's the kingdom of God incarnate. And now he comes and stays at a house of a sinner. And the sinner is named Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come into your house. And he's looking around. And you know why? Because this, because this Roman collaborator, this Jew, is the son of Abraham. Holy smoke. Abraham's the father of faith. Zacchaeus is a, is a son of faith. That, that would not have gone over very well, by the way. To those that were grumbling against Jesus and Zacchaeus, Jesus says, this man, like you, you are a son of Abraham. You are, you are, a, you are one that tries to follow the faith. Yeah, but he's collaborating with the Roman Imperium. He, well, okay, but by faith and by activity, he is a son of Abraham. Okay, okay. Kill him. And so, oh, there's something wrong. So the problem is going to be, you know, what are you going to do, uh, Jesus? You're in this man's house, and he says to the elders, "He is a son of Abraham." He does follow the Torah. And if he's defrauded anyone, he repents and gives back four times as much, not twice. Double Torah. For the, and then he says the following, Jesus says, for the son of man, remember? Son of man, Daniel 7, 14. All authority in heaven and on earth, all authority, every language, people, and nation, comes under the jurisdiction of the son of man. So that means that he has jurisdiction. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the law. Just like God in Genesis chapter two and three. Where are you, Adam and Eve? Where are you? It's the uh, heat of the day and you're hiding from me because I know you have sinned. Well, uh, we are naked. Yes, I know that you, who told you that you were naked? Ah, you ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. What I told you not to do, you have done. But I'm searching after you to redeem you, to save you from yourselves. So the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. So who's looking for who? Zacchaeus thinking, I'm looking for Jesus. No, Jesus is looking for you. Zacchaeus, Jesus was looking for you. So he allowed you to go up the sycamore tree as if you're acting independently, thinking that I'm going to get a quick glimpse of this, this rock star rabbi preaching and teaching and healing the multitudes. I'm going to go up and see him. And you walk when he looked up. He saw Zacchaeus. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. Exactly. Today, salvation is going to enter your house. Why? Because you are a son of Abraham. And the son of man has been sent to seek out the lost and to save the lost. Now, what about the grumblers? Did he seek them? Does he want them to be lost? Of course not. But they're still grumbling. 
and they and I might add, they will continue to grumble. Why? Jesus, you're not living up to our expectation of what a rabbi should be. Does that sound familiar? You know, uh, people in their relationship with the others. I don't like you. You know why? You're not living up to my expectation the way you should be. I have plans for you, and you're not doing what I think you should be doing. Instead, you're doing what you think you should be doing. Well, what you are doing, I don't necessarily approve nor care of. And so that's why I've been aloof from you. You're not living up to my expectation. Uh, uh, we do that all the time. Uh, resentment is nothing more than premeditated, unrealized expectations. When you set someone up in your mind, you're not doing what I think you should be doing. Resentment is when you're not fulfilling what I think you should do. And you're just simply setting yourself up for a premeditated resentment. That's all you're doing. You know, and we do it all the time. You know, why can't you live up to what I think you should be doing? Well, because maybe I can't. Little story to tell you about. Absolutely true story. At our house of studies in Oakland, California, we have all sorts of trees in the back. We have our own little forest. And out in the front where the chapel is, there were these beautiful apple trees. They're gorgeous apple trees. And once I was assigned outside the House of Studies, I used to come back, back during the summers and visit people in the House of Studies, plus my friends in Berkeley and in Oakland. And, uh, and I used to take uh, meditational walks outside the chapel where all the apple trees were. And they were great, you know. And I, th there were groups of them. And some of them always had apples and others didn't have apple. But this is the time, you know, late August where apples started to start to take form. The bloom was earlier during the months of April, May and June. And by, you know, by, by, uh, by uh, the end of summer, fruit should be on the vine. You know, F fruit should have been on the tree. And I remember going to the small little apple tree and there'd be no fruit on it. I go, what the heck is going on with this one? Everyone else has apples, but why not you? You never see <laughs> to fulfill the expectation that I have of you like the other trees. You're smaller uh, and every time I come, the rest of the trees are doing well. I, Except you, and I think to myself, I said, ah, for heaven's sake. So this happened year after year. So I go and walk around. I said, there's that doggone tree again. You know, doggone it. When are you ever going to bloom? When are you ever going to give fruit, for heaven's sakes? You know, gee, my knees. You know. Well, one time, I didn't go there during July or August. I went later, like October, like November. It was fall and crisp, the blue sky. And the trees had all had apples hanging, lots of wild apples, red apples. I go, let's see if that doggone small tree is going to have fruit this year. It hasn't so far. I've never seen it bear fruit. Never. So I was walking, praying, thinking, I go, I'm gonna go look at that tree. I went over to the tree and my mouth dropped. I said, now I get it. 
Now I get it. There was a reason why you didn't have apples on your limbs and on your trees. You're not an apple tree. You're a pear tree. You bloomed later. Expectations. Big surprise. I said, I said you're a pear tree. Is that it? You're a pear and gorgeous pears, but not apples. Very interesting. You know, expectations. There are other expectations. We have Jesus and the fig tree. This is not found in Luke. It's, uh, well, it's only found in Mark and Matthew. So I'm going to uh, go over to another gospel. And I'm going to take this from Mark, which is the earlier gospel. Um, this is Mark chapter 11, the cursing of the fig tree. On the following day, this is Mark 11, 12 to 14. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. Is this the season for figs? Don't know. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Not the appropriate time. Okay. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday is withered. And Jesus answered, have faith in God, truly I tell you. If you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe and you will receive it. And it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, notice, stand praying, you don't kneel. That's a Gentile posture. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Remember the tax collector and the Pharisee in the temple? Okay. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. That fig tree is a very important image. It's Israel. Uh, beautiful foliage, yeah. You have the appearance of the beautiful foliage. The fruit of faith is missing. Then, of course, in Luke's gospel, uh, in 70 AD, when the Romans come and wipe out the theocracy of Israel, destroy the temple in August of the year 70, uh, the fig tree uh, is utterly destroyed and will remain gone, destroyed for 2000 years until May of 1948, when Israel is reconstituted as its own nation state. Uh, yeah, Jesus, you know, it's it, in Luke's gospel, and now of course in Mark and Matthew, uh, Jesus wants Israel to bear fruit. You, you, you are supposed to bear fruit, but you don't. Not a good sign, not a good sign. So you will uh, 
because you were unable to recognize the time of your visitation, then as John the Baptist predicted, you know, Israel is this olive tree, this fig tree, this vineyard is cut down to the root. And John says, if you do not repent, even the root will be destroyed. And that's what happened in 70 AD. Disbelief at the time of your visitation in the Lucan narrative is the cause for the complete destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Roman Imperium. So again, it does rest on faith. Now, there is the prediction in Luke about the destruction of Jerusalem. This is Luke chapter 19, verses 39 to 44. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, order your disciples to stop, you know, because uh, he had just walked in and they were proclaiming him as the Messiah. It's, uh, it's uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, he was now approaching the path down to Mount Olive and the whole multitude of disciples were, began to praise God joyfully with the loud voice for all his deeds of power they had seen, saying, blessed is he, the king, who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in God in the highest. And then in Mark, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It's Palm Sunday. Okay. So he's going through Jerusalem. And the Pharisees in the crowd said, teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones should shout out. And as he came near to the city, the th uh, he wept over it, saying, if even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you, surround you, and then hem you in, hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone atop another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. And he enters Jerusalem and starts to clean the temple. This is, this is the last straw. The elders of Israel say, you, you're acting as if you are the long awaited divinic Messiah. Herod is our king. Are you usurping the legitimate authority and power of, of King Herod? Is that what you're doing, Jesus of Nazareth? You act as if this is some messianic enthronement as you come into Jerusalem. Herod is our king, not you. Stop your disciples. Jesus says, it can't be stopped. Even the stones would speak out. He then enters and he does that which in fact gets him into all sorts of trouble. This is the last straw. Luke 19, 45 to 48. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those 
who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but did not find anything they could do for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. In Mark, which is the earliest gospel, then they entered and came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned their money tables, changers, and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard this, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. This was an arm takeover. We've all seen Jesus movies where he, he goes into the temple and he overturns a few tables and the, 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 the bowls filled with money for the money changes are all thrown to the ground. And, and you think that's it. No, that's not it. The temple treasury was part of the whole uh, protocol. The, there was a whole line of stalls in the protocol of Solomon. The temple treasury was huge. It was run by the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priests of Israel. They were the Levitical uh, priestly tribe. The Sadducees, un unlike the Pharisees, uh, they were priests ordained by heredity. You had to belong to a certain family in order to be a Levi or a priest of good standing. And you ran the temple concession. You had to exchange money. Ordinary Roman coin had the image of the emperor. Okay. And the emperor is a son of God. He is a divine being. Well, you can't go into the temple precincts with an image of a foreign god. Okay. And so money changers were there to exchange Roman coinage with the image of the emperor. And of course, uh, that would have been Tiberius later on with Caligula and Nero. They were seen as divine entities in human form, by the way. So you couldn't bring these coins in. So you exchange them for Jewish liturgical coinage. And with that coinage, you would buy the commodities used for sacrifice. So the pigeons, the animals, the, the sheep, the lamb, the sheep, the goats, the oxen, whatever offered up in Holocaust or whatever liturgical matter or offering that you would like to give back to God, you had, you had to pay for it. You had to pay for it, okay? And so, and the animals had to be of pristine quality, real, without any defect or imperfection. But he calls it, you've turned my father's house of prayer to a den of thieves. Many scholars believe that it was you know, extortion. They knew they were selling defective product, a defective commodity. The animal or the fruit or the grain or whatever was less than admirable, less than perfection. God, oh, you, oh, God the best of the field, the best of the flock. 
the best from the orchard. That was a matter of justice. Okay, give God the first fruits, the best. They weren't doing that. And they were charging exorbitant prices, extortion. So, so not only are you cheating God by, by not giving him the pristine quality that should have been offered, you're, you're cheating people by charging exorbitant prices and the, that which is being offered is in fact defiled or less than perfect. So it's, a, so it's a violation of the virtue of justice. Give me that which is due to me, which is owed to me by contract. That's why he calls it a den of thieves. And let's get something straight. He could not have done this on his own. He shut down the temple sacrifice of Israel by closing off the temple treasury. You couldn't buy the things offered in sacrifice. See, so for all practical purposes, he nullified and stopped the liturgical sacrificial activity of Israel. That got him killed. I mean, there's no way that he could have done this by himself. It was an armed takeover by him and his followers, plain and simple. When the sun went down, when the afternoon ended, then he and his followers left the temple precincts. So the Sadducean uh, legitimacy then took over again. But I would presume that would have been the final straw. Now in John's gospel, that begins John's gospel. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the end of the ministry of Jesus. And that, in my mind, got him into all, all sorts of issues. Not only he were people saying he's a long-awaited Messiah. I wonder what Herod would, would have had to say. You know, I'm king of Israel, not this itinerant Galilean rabbi. Second, he went over and took over the temple. He's got to be killed. We got to get rid of him. We have to get rid of this man. Mm -hmm. And so they do. But God has other plans. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's time for question and answer. Uh, Jay, let's begin. All right, everyone, time for Q&A. Um, go ahead and activate your cameras if you have a question. And let's uh, see who has a question this morning. Go ahead and raise your hand. Lance, if you would unmute. Hi, Lance. How are you doing? I see you there. Absolutely marvelously. And you? Well, what's up? What's your question? I have, I have a question. Most of this uh, discussion and discourse applies specifically to the Jews. And I always, I understand what you're saying. And I'm wondering how the Gentile population of the time are, are how, how do they exist in this same situation? Not knowing probably anything about the Torah. Not yeah, uh, that's why. seeing these miracles and, and yeah. what are they doing? Uh, this is where, uh, so in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, seldom does he leave the historical parameters of Israel. He does go outside uh, and visit Tyre and, and Sidon, and there's the uh, Syro-Phoenician woman who's Greek by birth, and, uh, and he tries to uh, visit that land without being recognized, but it's too late. They already recognize him and because he could not be hid because <laughs> he's a wonder worker, he's a healer. That's why uh, in Matthew and in Mark, uh, she, uh, in Matthew, she's a Canaanite, the historical enemy of Israel. And in uh, Mark, she's Syrophoenician, but Greek by birth. And of course, if you read the Old Testament, um, the Phoenicians were also arch enemies of Israel. And yet it's this outside Gentile that G Jesus, son of David, have mercy on my daughter 
who's ill in bed and is possessed by an evil spirit, come and cure her. And Jesus says, um, but I'm only here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it's not right to give the children's bread or the wisdom bread, the food, the Torah bread to dogs. Yeah. But the woman says, ah, yes, Jesus, but, and dogs or puppies, the nations or others, those are code words for Gentiles, okay? It's not right to give the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Namely, it's not right to give that which is owed to believing Jews and give it to uh, what? Uh, polytheistic Gentiles that don't believe in God? No. Yeah. And so, but the woman says, ah, but Lord, even the dogs, the puppies, eat the scraps that fall from their master's table. Jesus, ah, woman, for saying this, your daughter's now healed. She, you know, she was saying, I want to profess my faith in this God of, in this God of Abraham, in this God of Israel. I want access to the table. I don't want to be like a dog eating scraps. I want to sit at the table of Abraham. But even the dogs eat the scraps, the the uh, the wisdom bread of the Torah. Of course, yeah. Jesus is Jesus is that wisdom bread in human form. He's the wisdom bread, and he and he says, "But woman, you know, it's not right." But she says, "But." I'll eat the scraps. And Jesus, ah, you, you want access to the table, don't you? Yes, yeah. I want access to the table. Done. Your daughter's well. Yeah. And in Matthew, <laughs> it says, <coughs> to the Canaanite woman, again, a historical enemy of Israel, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. That's incredible. Yeah. So he did have a relationship with Gentiles. And that's why in John's gospel, just to move out of the synoptic tradition, in John's gospel, the Greeks come and, and go to Peter and Andrew. We would like to see Jesus, please. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. So yeah, he's, he's open uh, and he will cure uh, people that are non-Jewish, <coughs> but they have to make a profession of faith. Uh, one thing about uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very, very different from John, in order for a miracle to take place or some wonder work, there has to be some attestation, some profession of faith. Do you believe in, do you have faith that I may do this? Yes, I do, Jesus. Okay, it's done. In John, it's different. The sign or the seven signs that he does within the first 12 chapters of the uh, Gospel of John, these are all signs. The signs themselves have the potential efficacy to bring about a profession of faith. However, the sign does not produce faith. It elicits a faith that's already there. And Jesus demands that it comes out of you in some form of a profession. So that's, that's, so that's the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John. John, the signs have a certain efficacy in and of themselves that can elicit a faith it can't produce faith okay in matthew mark and luke if there's no faith there's no sign period so there is a different emphasis so yeah that whole gentile thing they will have access but uh uh but first uh, again he made it very clear i come for the lost sheep of the house of israel because they are lost and I'm making a house call. God is making a house call. He is the divine physician 
and he's making a house call. So I will deal with them first. However, if there's a Gentile and he's in the crowd, because he heals the multitudes, like he heals the lepers. One of yep. those lepers was a Samaritan. Yep. So he will heal. Also the, the soldier or the, the soldier. The soldier yeah, who asked the soldier also. Daughter. That is but correct. There's a uh, there's a there's a profession of faith. Because he, even though he was part of the Roman Imperium, he's mm -hmm. asking of Jesus to help. Yeah, his daughter. in fact, in fact, uh, last yes, in fact, when the Roman centurion sends m messengers to Jesus, the messengers say to Jesus, he's a Roman centurion. He does have a slave boy who he loves. The slave boy is dying or is very ill, and he wants you to come to his home, and we're giving you that message. But then the Saturian finds out that he might be coming and he says, wait a minute here. I know Jewish law. He can't step into my house because I am a Gentile. You go back to Jesus as he's pretty close to the house and tell him, no, you don't have to come into my house. Just say the word yeah. and my servant shall be healed. Yep. And Jesus said, I wish I would see this in Israel. Yeah. So it's a cure from afar. So yep. he doesn't even have to be there to be yep. efficacious. And so he said, and Jesus marvels. He looks at the crowd. I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. And he says that to a Gentile. So bottom line is, you don't have to be a member of the club in order to receive the benefits from the God that calls you to be a part of that club. Uh, your entrance to the club is faith, plain and simple, faith and grace, that's it. Now, for us Roman Catholic, faith and grace is, ch is channeled through baptism, okay? Yeah. So you have to make some profession of faith. But for those who have never made a profession of faith, grace is still being bestowed yep. on the moral conscience. And insofar yep. as you cooperate with that grace, which is salvific and has the power to save, if you cooperate with that grace as, as God manifests that grace through your moral conscience and you, since, since the moral conscience is a practical judgment in how you live out your life, it is a practical judgment and if you choose well, guided by grace, guided by the spirit, then the application of the effects of Christ's death and resurrection are now made applicable to you by way of the Holy Spirit and by way of grace. And so it's by grace we are saved. And, you know, and, and that's the point, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, you would hope people people would be inside the club, whatever that means. Yeah. But grace being grace, grace can work in the club and outside the club. It's better to be in the club and have the sacramental access, obviously, to Christ himself. But if you don't have that access for various reasons, cultural, historical, or where you are with, within the world, God will not be stymied. God still say, God still sends grace. And insofar as the human person, as a self-autonomous acting moral agent, chooses and cooperates with that grace, then that grace that saves you is made applicable to you, even though you may not even recognize uh, this God that is in fact saving you, because our ignorance doesn't uh, uh, yeah. deny the ability of God to save you. Yeah. Let God be God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Go uh, ahead. Let's see. Um, Marcel and Z uh, Zuniga, if you would um, unmute. A real quick question. 
Yesterday you were talking about by whose authority. Today you're talking about expectations. And both of those require us to kind of have an understanding of where they fit in. And so here's the off the wall question. Behind yeah. your windows, is that just real windows or is that a theatrical backdrop? <laughs> just off the wall question. <laughs> where, where, where from do you come, Roger? <laughs> Uh, uh, Jay and I are, are uh, both laughing at this. This is the backdrop. T touch it for him, Father. This is the backdrop. No, but I, I haven't seen I haven't Hold seen on. the trees moving, so I, I was just curious. And again, it's, this is it's the just backdrop. has nothing has nothing to do. I was just it was just a, a random thought. We, so. we decided uh, the windows were a little more pleasing than a white wall for an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we have three, we have the windows, we have a cathedral scene, and we have a lovely uh, baronial library den scene, which, which uh, many of you ha have made comment on, like, where is that room? Where, yeah. where are you filming from? Room. Well, I'm filming from the adult education classroom at St. Dominic's Church in Eagle Rock, California, and this is a backdrop. Well, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and someday I'd like to start a pear tree. Um, <laughs> I think William had, Father, I think William had a question. Uh, perhaps we can take one more before we okay, wrap up. Okay, William, go ahead. Turn on your mic. I still don't hear you. Uh, one more try there, William. I think we're, we're having some uh, audio technical difficulties this morning. Okay. All right. Un are there any other questions? If not, I will close. Well, listen. Uh, yeah. Uh, God comes after you. He doesn't wait for you to say, gee, I made a mistake. Maybe I ought to go back to God and say, I'm sorry. He doesn't wait for you. He goes out to get you. So he will <coughs> he will eat at the house of Zacchaeus. Come down, Zacchaeus. I want to sit at your house today. And even though the other people are grumbling, and rightly so, too bad. You are a son of Abraham. They don't know that you give half of what you earn to the poor. They don't know that if you've cheated anyone, you, you will pay it back four times, even though the Torah says only twice, Roman law says four, and you go to Roman law and you, and you will pay back four times if you have defrauded anyone. God goes looking for you. And so you go looking for him, you know, and God says, I'm here, come down. I want to stay with you today. May he stay with us always, okay? God bless, I'll see you this evening. Thank Take you care. all for joining us this morning. We hope to see you tonight. Have a wonderful day, everyone.